Right. Uh, I'm here to talk about uh, Spitsbergen, and I'll just get straight on with it. Uh, um, here we go. So, um, uh, when because the uh, uh, the Earth is spherical, uh, when you look at a flat map. Uh, we use the Mercator uh, projection, which starts doing funny things up near the North Pole because they've got to make uh, something that is essentially 3D, uh, 2D, and it makes a big difference up there. But uh, Spitsbergen is the archipelago right at the top of the map there. Uh, it's about 500 miles north of the top of Norway, um, of which it is considered a part. And um, uh, it's, uh, uh, it, well... It, it, the Arctic Circle, it's as far north of the Arctic Circle as London is south of the Arctic Circle. So you're really talking serious north up there in, 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 in Spitsbergen. The Arctic Circle uh, is where the um, uh, where on Midsummer's Day at the summer solstice, the uh, the sun does not drop below the horizon. It stays uh, fully above the horizon. But we're, I told you, we're way, way further north of the Arctic Circle. So over there, the sun just goes round and round the sky. And this is about as low as it goes. This was taken at midnight. And you can see that it's, it's nowhere near there. And then it just carries on going round again and there. So there's the, the, it, it really is, um, well, excitingly disconcerting because uh, it, you're getting a 24 hour um, uh, sunshine there. So um, the name Spitsbergen means pointed mountains, and it was given uh, uh, named as such by Barents. And that used to be the name for the whole archipelago. Then Russia took it over. And then when they decided that there wasn't anything of any great value here, they gave it back to Norway uh, uh, under uh, the, the Treaty of Svalbard in 1925. And then Norway changed its name to Svalbard, which means uh, cold coast. And the name Spitsbergen, and we usually just re, uh, use for the, uh, the, the the main island of the archipelago. Uh, that's uh, uh, Svalbard means cold coast, and that's uh, uh, a very cold coast, as you can see there. Now, um, one of the first times I went to uh, um, Spitsbergen, the uh, you can see a great big cruise ship in the back. Uh, ground there and we saw this cruise ship and it went to Longyearbyen and it went to Nyalison which is where this is and um, and it finished at about the same time as we did and all of these uh, clients disembarked and then caught the flights back to London with us and I ended up chatting with people who were sitting next to me on the train on, on the plane going back and in the airport and uh, all of them had been lured by these adverts for cheap holidays up in uh, you know see the land of the midnight sun and a realm of the polar bear etc and they'd all gone for it because it seemed like a bargain but when you're on a ship that size it can't land anywhere and they don't have zodiacs to get you ashore so most of them well in fact all of them never even saw a polar bear or a walrus or any of the other great wildlife that's up there because they could only land in the towns and the towns aren't generally the best places for wildlife so uh, we tend to go on smaller boats uh, the ortelius as uh, you're probably sick of seeing the ortelius now but uh, 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 the smaller boats, and uh, they uh, they house it 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 helps with just over a hundred passengers, and uh, we have uh, uh, lots of zodiacs, which means that we can get off the boat and uh, go and make landings uh, at uh, many opportunities whenever it's safe to do so. Uh, here's an example of when it wasn't safe to do so. We thought we were going to uh, land on the beach here, and then somebody said, uh, "What's that stone over there? Can you see over in the far left?" And there was a snoozing polar bear uh, there. So we had to then come back to the ship and go a bit further north and uh, find a safer place to land. Uh, I won't bother showing you that, but it's the same ship that we use for Antarctica. And uh, so the same cabins, the same dining room, etc. So um, what we plan to do is uh, Longyearbyen is that uh, uh, inlet on the uh, west coast, which is all warmed by the Gulf Stream, by the way. So it, it, it tends to thaw much more than the rest of it does. And that's where our, uh, most of the good flowers are. And then what we do is we, we try to circumnavigate the main island of Spitsbergen. But what that... Um, uh, doesn't really show at the top is what we also try to do is head north to reach the um, uh, the pack ice at, uh, at the top where the sea freezes uh, for uh, reasons that I'll tell you when we get there.
Now, uh, the first time I went to Spitsberg, and it, it was many years ago, um, uh, probably 15 or 20 years ago, and uh, I, I was given an overspill uh, uh, group that, that couldn't go on the main charter. And uh, so we didn't have any say where we went. We just had to go where the boat took us. And I tried to find wildlife wherever that was. And we just seemed to visit endless trappers' huts and, and mining settlements and coal mines and things like that. And, uh, you know, lots of places where we weren't likely to see much wildlife. But on a nature trek tour, when we've got the whole boat, we decide where we're going to go. Uh, we can dictate the, 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 the tour. And, uh, and what we do is we maximise all the best places for wildlife and, uh, and, and scenery and, uh, and things like this. It, we've got a lot of experience up there. We've been there many times and, and we know the best places that uh, nature trek clients will like. And we aim to take you there to uh, maximise the experience for you. Um, how'd you get there? Well, we fly from London via Oslo right the way up then to uh, uh, to Spitsbergen. And the, uh, there's a tiny little airstrip at Longyearbyen where you get off. And uh, that's us disembarking on the um, uh, uh, at Longyearbyen. And uh, just uh, I put the camera out of the um, uh, out of the plane window and took this as we were arriving in Svalbard. But that just gives you an idea of the kind of place it is. I just love that all these snow covered mountains and uh, you can see some valley mists in there as well such an exciting place to be so um uh this is the capital city of um uh of, of svalbard uh, uh long the the uh, although the number of residents it would hardly even rate as a village in uh, in england a uh, tiny little place you can see that uh, they're all geared up for uh the nine months of the year when there's snow around because there's lots of skidoos but not many cars uh there are a few cars uh, they're electric cars and have been for a long time long before we started getting electric cars but really not many cars and not many roads either uh, because there's nowhere to drive to really because there's no uh, no other settlements um but uh, so you don't get many roads you don't get many road signs but the road signs that you do see are very very different from the ones that you might expect to see in britain um i'm told that that means applies to the whole of Svalbard, meaning wherever you go, you've got to look out for polar bears. So uh, north to south, uh, wherever, there's always a chance of seeing polar bears. Uh, the other thing that you're absolutely guaranteed to see is uh, I think it's Europe's only truly wild population of reindeer because uh, most of the ones in uh, Scandinavia and mainland Scandinavia are uh, farmed in some way and they're owned and ear tanked and things like that. So they're not genuinely wild ones. But up here, nobody farms and nobody does anything and they wander around. It's a little bit like going to Scotland and seeing sheep wandering all over the place. Up there, you get reindeer just just grazing in amongst the, uh, uh, the the cabins and because nobody's shooting them or hunting them they've become really habituated to humans so uh, they barely even deign to look up when you're uh, when you uh, ask them to smile for a photograph as well uh, some of the birds that you'll see around Longyearbyen, uh, we, we used to spend a, uh, a day in Longyearbyen before heading out in the boat, and there's plenty to see around there. Uh, Arctic terns, where, they're, uh, where they really live up to their uh, name, um, it always seems a bit perverse calling them Arctic terns when most of us see them on the Farne Islands, uh, which is uh, uh, about as far from the Arctic as, uh, <laughs> as, as we are now. Um, but they do all the same things. They go and hunt and they uh, come back with fish and they often nest on the side of the roads because they're so little used on the gravel there. And uh, they, uh, uh, they attack people just the same, but they also attack absolutely everything. They're really feisty. I've even watched them attacking polar bears, pecking the heads of polar bears like they do on the, uh, uh, the Farne Islands with visitors. Uh, this is the only songbird on uh, Svalbard. Uh, they're common enough as well, snow buntings. You tend to see them all over the place, but particularly common around the towns. They, uh, they, they do nest in the buildings there. And you see them, uh, the males in this resplendent black and white plumage that you never, well, I, I don't see them in Britain like this. The females are also pretty good and unusual from what, uh, you know, you don't often see the females in this plumage either, even though they're much duller than the males. Uh, what we normally see them like is that with the sort of little gingery cheek patch and the breast band and uh, things like that but um, I've never seen one looking like that in Svalbard always in breeding plumage. Uh, 
Um, this is up in the uh, the cemetery behind uh, uh, Long Yerbien. You can see the old uh, mining uh, 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 works in the background, and you can just see the abundance of flowers there. Uh, the the tiny little white thing is Arctic bell heather on the left, and the one on the right is mountain avens, which is quite a scarce plant in Britain, but there it's one of the commonest plants. It just grows everywhere, carpets the place. Uh, ptarmigan also occur uh, right down to sea level there. They're one of only two birds that spends the entire winter in um, uh, on Svalbard. You know, they, they don't migrate anywhere. And um, uh, the other thing that I find interesting is uh, up in Britain, our ptarmigan turn white in winter and brown in summer. But up there, the males remain white all year round, and it's only the females that turn brown when they're nesting. So, um, yeah, so you often see, uh, well, dirty white males and uh, and uh, the females there. This was just uh, dust bathing on the uh, on the road at the back of Long Um the, uh, the Some of the birds that you see up there are in a very different plumage than the ones that you're used to seeing in Britain. So this is one of the commonest breeding waders up on Svalbard, and this is purple sandpiper. But look at that sort of uh, spangled back and the, and the really complicated marbled face pattern. And when you look at what we see in Britain, they're, uh, uh, you know, plain grey face and grey backed, you know, not uh, uh, very, very different birds completely. And also, uh, I think that the Dunlin look very different. This is almost monochrome. Look, it's sort of like devoid of any rufous. It's just, uh, it's uh, like a black and white and grey Dunlin. Uh, this is the Arctic race of Dunlin, whereas the one that I'm used to seeing here in the Pennines is the Shintzii race, which is really bright orange all over the upper parts. That's uh, one of the, that I took on the moors just near me. So you can see how very different it is from the, uh, uh, the Svalbard Dunlin, the Arctic Dunlin. Um, plenty of eider ducks as well nest around, but they, uh, the only place I ever see them nesting is wherever you get pens with huskies in them. Uh, the huskies pull the sleds in winter or when there's snow on the ground, and, uh, and, but because they're always barking and, and smelling like huskies, it tends to keep the predators away, which is uh, why the, uh, the, the, the eiders like to nest uh, very close. So you can see the dog pen there in the background. And uh, the predator that they want to keep away is the Arctic fox. I actually, uh, I, I spotted this one out of the window and it was wandering around and I thought well if this was a weasel or a stoat or even a fox I might actually be able to lure it to come closer by making a squeaking noise like a rodent so I did do and it came right up to me looking up at me uh, this was just out of my window and uh, uh, seeing what the noise was but the irony is is that there are no rodents on uh, Svalbard there's no lemmings no mice voles nothing so that um, uh, you know but this thing still responded when I made a squeaking noise like a vole. Um, the, uh, the, the a few, a few uh, well a, a few a couple of hundred miles north of uh, of Longyearbyen is the only other sizable uh, uh, conurbation, and this is a place called Nyalison or New Allison, and uh, this is supposed to, supposedly the most northerly inhabited um, uh, settlement on the planet. Uh, I'll take their word for it. Uh, I don't think there's anywhere else habitable north of this in Greenland, but it's mainly uh, uh, polar researchers that live there, and it was also the place that people used to base themselves for uh, uh, treks to the north. North Pole or balloon flights to the North Pole, but uh, it's um, but we usually call in there, not least because it's good for wildlife. There's a great big lake just on the edge of town, and here you see red-throated divers and uh, breeding long-tailed ducks in in a quite unusual plumage because most of us only see long-tailed ducks in winter plumage in Britain, which is quite different from that with the black face and head with a little white eye patch. The um, lots of geese nesting around here as well. The commonest, most abundant is um, uh, barnacle geese. Uh, here's some young barnacle geese. And this is the population, the Svalbard population, that all winter in Kylaverock in southwest Scotland. Uh, that I'm, I'm hoping that this it's not going to have affected their numbers too badly because I know that they uh, they were hit quite hard with bird flu there. Um, Pink-footed geese are the other. Um, uh, uh, goose that that nests around uh, there. They um, no, uh, this uh, Britain has eighty five percent of the world's pink footed geese in winter, but the Svalbard ones are the fifteen percent that don't winter in Britain. These ones winter in the Low Countries. Uh, um, um, 
like uh, Belgium and Netherlands, uh, Luxembourg, uh, but their um, uh, uh, but but the rest of them come from uh, Greenland and Iceland and come to Britain. But they're still there. And the other uh, 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 goose that nests up there is the pale-bellied Brent goose. And this population on Svalbard winters entirely at uh, Lindisfarne in Northumberland and that's the only place they winter and this is the only place they breed so it's uh, you know it's almost like having a timeshare isn't it they've got the place where they go for the winter and the place where they go for the spring and they're in uh, summer and they're incredibly sight faithful. Uh, Nyalesund also has its uh, its uh, huskies that uh, pull the sleds and uh, I, I often make a, an effort to go near to where all the huskies are uh, for one reason is they don't feed them on kenna meat up there or pedigree chum because there's no shops to buy it. What they all feed on is seal. So they do shoot seals and they hang up the thing and, and feed them with bits of meat off the seals. But when you hang up bits of meat like that, it attracts things uh, that we want to see, including uh, the ivory gull, which is quite a, as a scarce and sought after species there. But uh, Nihalison is, is one of the, you know, the first reliable sites to see uh, uh, beautiful ivory gulls. I'll tell you more about ivory gulls later on. Also, just across the bay from um, uh, Nihalison is a place where long-tailed skewers nest. Long-tailed skewers aren't a common bird in uh, Svalbard because they normally feed on lemmings and there are no lemmings there. So um, they, uh, but, but there has been a reliable small population very close to Nihalison and they're incredibly confiding and curious as well. Sometimes somebody said, oh, if you pick up a pebble on the beach and just flick it, they'll come and investigate. So I did just flick a pebble and it bounced over the tundra and it just flew straight down and looked at this pebble uh, to see what was going on. I mean, I suppose there's uh, not much to occupy them up on Svalbard, so they, uh, they're, they're, uh, they fall for tricks like that. Uh, there are plenty of Arctic skewers, though, that uh, uh, because they prioritise uh, seabirds and there's no shortage of seabirds for them to uh, uh, to mug around there. This one was uh, flying straight at my face. Actually, a few seconds later, it actually hit the front of my camera and knocked me off my feet. But uh, that's another story. <laughs> So um, uh, plenty of glaciers as well. We'll uh, usually visit uh, a good number of glaciers, uh, not least because they are very attractive. Um, as you probably know, glaciers are formed as rivers of snow or ice. They, they, it's all uh, fresh water from precipitation that, that, that freezes and builds up to a great big ice and then gravity makes it flow downhill. So as it goes over lumps, this slow moving river of ice, you, it, it, it will crack and fiss you. So you get one wonderful uh, spectacular patterns like this. And also the weight of the ice crushes and it causes uh, water to melt. And because it's fresh water, it flows like a, a freshwater river underneath and, and hits the salt water. And many of the invertebrates up there are really salt tolerant, uh, salt sensitive. They have to get exactly the right level of salt. So when fresh water hits them, it often stuns them, uh, little copepods and things, and they come floating to the surface. And it's an absolute bonanza for feeding seabirds. I mean, you know, just look at that on the, uh, uh, the, the water, all the those little dots on the the water there. Many of these are uh, kittiwakes, uh, the same as we get in Britain, um, but there are also glaucous gulls. Um, it's um, uh, having bird watched in Britain for all of my life. Uh, I, in my formative years of gull watching, we used to sort of go through the gull flocks, praying and looking for white wingtips at the uh, uh, at the end because you knew that would be a glaucous or an Iceland gull. But up in Svalbard, all the big gull flocks are glaucous gulls, and you sort of ski skimming through looking for a rare herring gull or a great black back gull amongst the, the hundreds of uh, glaucous gulls there. Um, the uh, uh, All the fulmers are blue as well, uh, what people call blue fulmers. They're actually a, a grey colour. They vary, but they're all degrees of, uh, of their, that's quite a pale one top right and uh, quite a dark one right in the centre there. But you can see they don't look like the fulmers that uh, uh, we get in Britain with the, the snowy white heads. Uh, I don't really think I've ever seen a blue fulmer in Britain, uh, but um, and I don't think I've ever seen a white fulmer up in Svalbard either, but uh, so it, it's almost like getting a different bird when you go and see those. 
Uh, black guillemots are very common as well. This one was just sort of sitting on a little iceberg, uh, a bergy bit, as they call it, and it sort of plopped into the water just as we passed, showing the stunning white underwing as well. Uh, great birds. You'll see lots of those up there. Uh, this is an ivory gull and a glaucus gull in the background there, uh, just flying in front of the lovely sort of blue ice of the uh, of, of, of the glacier. And uh, Sabine's gull as well. Sabine's gull isn't a common bird on Salvard, but again, we know two or three places where they do nest and where there's a good chance of seeing them. Uh, but where you get big um, numbers of birds at the glaciers, you can often find uh, the odd Sabine's gull flying around there like this one. Uh, this is a bearded seal. They often sit around at the base of glaciers. They just look like walruses, but without the uh, the tusks. A really big, fat seal, a huge thing, really. Uh, and uh, look at all the whiskers on it that they uh, use for um, finding food at the, uh, at the bottom, shellfish and things like that. So, and also beluga whales aren't actually that easy on Svalbard. There's plenty of them, but they're very inconspicuous. They just sort of keep to the shore and move around. But uh, again, they like to feed at the base of glaciers. So, um, uh, and we visit so many glaciers, we usually do bump into them, but it's, uh, um, you know, it's always exciting when you see uh, uh, belugas. That's an adult on top and a, uh, the gray youngster uh, just below. Now, uh, right at the top of uh, at the north end of Spitsbergen Island, there are some little islands that are in the bay there called Andoyan Islands. And uh, Andoyan apparently means duck islands because this is where all the ducks go to breed. Um, uh, th there's lots and lots of pairs of nesting eiders. Uh, there's eiders with uh, with youngsters and uh, there's also a few uh, king eiders up there but king eiders are always a lot more difficult to uh, uh, to, to, to see up there than uh, than common eiders and the reason why they nest on the islands is because the uh, the arctic foxes don't like getting their feet wet but they're incredibly good at finding nests so if there are any on the mainland they uh, they always get predated it's a bit like in britain uh, you know most of our uh, uh, really good sea ground nesting bird colonies are on uh, predator-free offshore islands. Um, but unfortunately for the ducks, uh, polar bears don't mind getting their feet wet. In fact, their scientific name is uh, uh, Ursus maritimus, which means the bear of the sea. And they do spend a lot of time in the sea swimming. They're perfectly at home there. And this one was on the Andoyan Islands, just fast asleep on the top. Uh, there. So uh, they don't spend all their time asleep. This one was obviously replete having uh, uh, fed on lots of eggs uh, uh, there. And uh, here's a, a mother with two one-year-old cubs. Again, I took this one on the uh, Andoyan Islands there. Um, we also, uh, uh, polar bears willing, spend a bit of time uh, um, wandering around on the tundra and uh, and having a look. You know, we might see some birds, but uh, also the flowers there are amazing because it's such a very short summer that everything uh, bursts into bloom uh, during that short period. And, uh, and I find the flowers there really exciting. They're a mixture of incredibly rare um, uh, alpine flowers in Britain and also birds uh, and also flowers that we don't tend to get in Britain. So this, for example, is the drooping saxifrage, um, one of the rarest plants in Britain. There's just a couple of sites in the Ben Laws area where it grows. And uh, yeah, up on Svalbard, they just grow like buttercups. They're absolutely everywhere. It's um, this is another highly sought after plant in Britain. This is the yellow marsh saxifrage. And uh, and again, it's absolutely everywhere. You'll see carpets of it uh, there. It's difficult to walk on the tundra without treading on this uh, uh, wonderful flora. Uh, that's the purple mountain saxifrage, a bit commoner in Britain, but it's still very much a montane plant, but it grows at sea level. Again, a, a, a common plant there. Uh, tufted saxifrage, another hideously rare thing in Britain, you know, just confined to one or two spots in Britain, yet a really, really common plant there on the tundra. Uh, this is the, the smallest flowering plant on Svalbard. This is something called Icelandic purslane, Canigia Icelandica. And this is again another plant that grows in one or two places in Britain that's highly sought after because it's rare and difficult to find. But it's not rare and difficult to find on Svalbard. So uh, if anybody wants to see Canigia, uh, Icelandic purslane, I'm pretty sure we can find it for you. Uh, this is a plant that doesn't grow in Britain. This is the spider saxifrage, uh, just uh, called the spider saxifrage because it produces these great red runners that look like spiders' legs. 
Uh, this is the sulfur coloured buttercup. There's actually a lot of buttercups on Svalbard, but none of the ones that we get in Britain. But, but there's uh, there's probably about ten or fifteen species, uh, and uh, you know lots of interesting ones. And you can see really robust and furry adaptations to a cold climate there. Uh, this is the you're probably familiar with the two species of lousewort that we have in Britain, and uh, this is the woolly lousewort. Uh, and again, I've never seen a plant as woolly as that in uh, in in, in Britain. And uh, another uh, rare favourite is this is the boreal Jacob's ladder. So it's a bit like the, the Jacob's ladder that grows rarely in Britain uh, and also a, a, as a common garden plant. But here, this is a really small thing. It's only about uh, 10 centimetres tall at, at, at the most there. And the national plant of Svalbard, this is a Svalbard poppy. Uh, it has two colour forms. This is the paler one. There's also a yellower one. But again, it grows everywhere on Svalbard. And the oyster plant, that's another very rare northern plant that grows only on beaches in Britain. But it doesn't grow only on beaches in Svalbard. I mean, I found this. This was just growing in one of the side uh, on the edges of one of the roads in uh, Longyearbyen. and this one. And uh, uh, th this is the moss campion. They call this one the compass flower because you can tell which way is south because the, the one on the south side of the tussock is the one that comes into bloom. And it's pretty, pretty a start that, isn't it? We're just having a half and half uh, uh, tussock. Um, nearly finished with the plants now. This is uh, polar campion uh, that has that really expanded calyx. Uh, again, quite unlike any kind of campion we have in Britain. And the one that uh, bizarrely everybody's really keen to see is the Arctic dandelion, which is white instead of yellow. Uh, so it doesn't really look like a dandelion, but it's actually quite a rare plant. And uh, if somebody finds a dandelion in flower, everybody wants to see the white dandelion. But uh, And again, we can usually find it. Now, when you leave the top of Svalbard, we can go up to where the sea is frozen. That's one of the, uh, the things that we always make time for on, uh, on these trips. And uh, so unlike glacier ice, which is fresh water, this is frozen seawater. Uh, and this is and where it breaks up. This is what we call the pack ice. So that was taken from the front of the boat uh, uh, there. And it's actually really good for wildlife up here. Um, you know, you'd think that when you're nowhere near land, but it's actually, you know, what you do see up here is really interesting stuff. Um, this is where the seals like to breed, um, uh, particularly ring seals. And these are harp seals as well. And they uh, they uh, build themselves a hole in the ice and, and give birth to a, a baby. And, it, and it's it, it hides in this uh, um, little bivouac in, in the ice. And uh, because this is where all the seals breed, this is where the polar bears want to be. Um, it's also, you, you know, you start bumping into walruses look at that one i mean isn't that so photogenic sitting from uh, on a uh, uh, there with its reflection on a little uh, bit of pack ice uh, with all that photogenic stuff in the background but uh, i love walruses but we'll come to that again um the um what you're looking for uh, here is something that's feeding on the seals and that is the characteristic uh, footprints of a polar bear there and you can see the blood uh, there and i don't think that's polar bear blood i think it's probably been uh, uh, managed to successfully catch a seal and it was taking it somewhere uh, uh, quiet so that it could eat it and uh, here is uh, said uh, polar bear uh, that's just uh, got an inside out um uh, harp seal there. Uh, I quite like this photograph just because the the, the face is framed by the uh, the flapping ivory gull. Now um, I'll show you another picture. That's uh, you can see the ivory gulls above it. Now ivory gulls are the only other species of bird that spends the entire uh, winter. It's it's their twenty four seven. Uh, uh, in in uh, in Svalbard, it doesn't usually wander any uh, anywhere. Uh, but, so even in winter, when it's really sub-zero temperatures and twenty-four hour darkness, it still continues to live up there. But it's ecologically linked with polar bears. What they do is they follow polar bears around, waiting for them to do a kill. And then what they do is they pick off the uh, the bits that the polar bear doesn't eat, and the polar bear doesn't eat anything. It high grades. It picks the things that it wants to feed on, um, uh, like the blubber, and then it leaves the bits it's not that interested in, like the mussel even, and will go off and find uh, um, uh, 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 something else to eat there. So um, 
Once when we were up on the back ice, we hadn't seen a polar bear and then somebody spotted one some distance away. This is the actual polar bear. And, uh, and it, it was lots of, of crumpled pack ice nearby and we're thinking we might not be able to get close to it. So what we decided to do was uh, the captain's suggestion was he said, what we'll do is we'll have bacon for dinner because when you, well, you're not allowed to feed polar bears, by the way, you can't throw them food to lure them. But he says, once you start cooking bacon, they find the smell irresistible and they start moving towards uh, the boat. So anyway, we went in and had our bacon for lunch. And then uh, when we came out, this polar bear was right below the edge of the ship by the galley where they were cooking the uh, uh, the bacon. I mean, imagine just looking over and that is what I took just looking straight down off the front of the ship with the uh, thing below us. Anyway, it realised that the smell of bacon had uh, subsided because it had all been eaten. And then the polar bear wandered off. So uh, uh, we couldn't see any polar bears at this point, but we decided we were going to go out from the boat in the uh, in the Zodiacs and go and have a look for it. And we all split up in different directions. And my boat went off somewhere and it wasn't long before I spotted the, first, uh, the polar bear. And it was quite distant, as you can see, that's straight off the camera that it was um and also uh, up near when you get near the north pole uh, that the mist sort of comes and goes as it as the, the temperature just sort of um, uh, ebbs and flows and uh, you know it's a really atmospheric place but then the polar bear spotted us and uh, and polar bears do one of two things they either come towards you or they run away they're frightened of you and you never know which one they're going to do but fortunately this one was an approacher and so it started to walk towards us and can I point out at this stage that uh, when I took these uh, photographs I only had a really cheap bridge camera uh, you know nothing fancy at all so all of these photographs were just taken pointing and pressing with a cheap camera and it started to approach and it started to come closer and even closer till eventually it just started walking in front of us like that. I mean, again, I haven't even edited that. That was just literally what it was like walking on the edge of the uh, uh, the ice in front of us. And um, somebody uh, uh, took this photograph uh, of me. I, I, I'm seeing the, my uh, uh, on my screen anyway. My um, uh, little icon on the right is actually covering me up, but I'm on the on the uh, the prow of the uh, of the zodiac looking at the boat. So that's that's the uh, the view from the other side of what I was viewing uh, a few seconds ago seeing the polar bear there right uh then it's time to head back uh, south and again wherever the sort of frozen sea or, or anywhere you can always bump into uh, uh, polar bears you know you've got to keep your eyes open all the time and uh, you can see the the mountains there as we uh, uh, approach uh, start of Spitsbergen again and I managed to take this photograph which I was actually quite pleased with again with the cheap camera but what I did was I zoomed right out to make it a wide angle and uh, I wanted to make the uh, polar bear look like a little ant in the context of its massive environment so you can see that tiny little uh, uh, dot at the bottom of the screen was a polar bear walking on the frozen sea at the north end of, uh, of Svalbard there um, when we get into the Hill Open Straits and we start to move south again, we usually try and visit one or two uh, walrus haul outs, uh, which is uh, something that's high on everybody's list who wants to visit the Arctic. And uh, they they do, well, the males spend an awful lot of time just sort of lounging around on the ice or on the beaches. And uh, they're really not that bothered. They're used to humans and uh, they're not dangerous at all. People sort of, we, we keep a certain safe distance from them. We don't go and sort of uh, uh, write up to them. Them, but it, you know you can get all the photographs you could ever wish for of them. Uh, this one we'd visited the hole out on the beach, and I noticed there was a few walruses in the water. So I lay down right on the edge of the of the uh, uh, the, the the water. I was almost getting wet elbows, and I, I got an ultra wide angle because I wanted to show the context of the environment. And the, these nosy walruses came up to see why I, what I was doing lying on the beach. They probably thought I was an abnormally slim walrus, and uh, it came over. But but, uh, and I managed to take this picture. So that was with an ultra wide angle lens. So they really were just a few feet away when I took that one.
Now, this group of, uh, of uh, walruses are actually more dangerous. This is the females. They, 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 they group into uh, uh, single sex groupings and the females look after the youngsters. And you can see that's a very young youngster in the middle. And the one below the tusked individual is a sort of like a teenager. But they're very protective over them. And uh, so we always give them a wide berth if we see a group of walruses in the sea, because uh, a group together usually means that uh, uh, there's youngsters there. But uh, I still thought it was quite interesting interesting showing the little baby walrus in the middle there. Now, um, uh, I've not mentioned uh, uh, some of the, uh, the seabirds yet, but that's a group of little orcs. But uh, you're seeing twice as many birds as there actually were there because the, it's the mirror calm reflection there. Uh, the upper birds are actually uh, uh, the little orcs, and then the lower half are actually the reflection of them in the mirrored water. If you have a look, all the, uh, uh, the bottom half ones are flying upside down there and uh, we visit uh, little orc colonies these number in the millions and what they do is they nest in boulder scree slopes uh, wherever there's suitable places including just at the back of long and uh, and uh, you can see them all sort of doing these fly throughs uh, uh, just next to the uh, the boulder scree slopes there again this was just taken with a really cheap camera as they all came whizzing over my head and the uh, but also as well as uh, uh, flying around they often sort of sit around on the edge of the colony and uh, whilst I've got this picture on, just have a look at the shape of the head of particularly that one on the right, which I'm guessing is the female. And can you see how slender the head is and uh, how it sort of tapers into the body? Well, look at this next one that looks like it's swallowed a ping pong ball. It's um, can you see it sort of uh, like all puffed up uh, uh, like a hamster with its cheeks full? And that's exactly what it is, um, because you know how puffins uh, hang around with a, a, a beak full of uh, sand eels? It showing to any prospective females that they're going to be a good provider and uh, and hopefully will be an attractive mate. Well, uh, these things feed on little copepods, little marine creatures. And what they do is they swim on the water, catch hundreds of these things until their cheeks are absolutely bulging, bulging. And then they sit around showing their sort of big swollen head, showing what a great provider they'll be. And I thought that that one uh, just really shows it well with the, uh, the ping pong ball head. Um, we also visit a place in uh, in Hinlopen Strait called Alka Fjellet, uh, which is a load of spectacular basalt columns, uh, which has got um, a huge, huge colony of uh, Brunix guillemots. Just let me show you this next picture. It looks like one of the biblical plagues of locusts or something, but each one of those tiny little dots in the sky is a Brunix guillemot flying backwards and forwards from the colony to the uh, uh, to the feeding grounds. Um, Brunix guillemots the northern counterpart of the common guillemot that we have in uh, Britain. But uh, you don't get common guillemots up here and you don't get brunics tend to, uh, very rare indeed, uh, in British waters. But up here, a really, really common bird. Look at that. Every Just like the guillemots at uh, Benton Cliffs or uh, the Farne Islands or wherever your uh, chosen guillemot colony is. Uh, and every, every little uh, uh, square inch of, uh, of, of um, shelf is, uh, is is covered with Brunitz guillemots. Uh, you can see there that they've got that little pale stripe on the on the uh, bill called the tomium stripe, and they're also very black coloured. They're not brown like guillemots; they're black like razor bills. And uh, there, even in the sea, the whole sea is just littered with uh, uh, rafts and rafts and rafts of, uh, of of these things. And wherever you get the uh, seabird colonies, you get the predators. These are a couple of patrolling glaucus gulls looking for unattended eggs or chicks and uh, arctic foxes always nest uh, uh, sit around um, these breeding colonies because they get things that fall off the cliffs you know they uh, scavenge things there there are whales up in uh, Svalbard as well. We always see uh, uh, the Arctic minke whales. Uh, very difficult to photograph, I find. You can see all the raft of guillemots on the water there, but you know they just come up and go straight down. Much easier to photograph are the larger things. The uh, this is the fin whale, which again is quite a common whale up in the uh, uh, up in Svalbard. And, uh, you know, we usually hope to see those, particularly in the Hinlopen Strait. And on recent trips, we've also been very lucky with getting the largest animal on the planet, which is uh, uh, blue whales. So, uh, uh, again, we, we put in a bit of time going to the areas where we we think we might be able to connect with them. So, uh, um, yeah, so th that's what we do there. 
Um, also, as we uh, uh, just head round, there are a few more uh, uh, islands, Edjoya, Logoya, and uh, there are some really good wildlife spots here. Uh, lots of walruses again. I took this at uh, uh, Logoya, uh, just one loafing in the water there, showing these magnificent uh, uh, tusks. But it's also the place where you get um, uh, grey phalaropes. Again, it seems really weird calling them grey phalaropes because they're always grey when we see them in Britain. But when you see them up there, they look this colour, you know, bright red with uh, uh, with a white um, uh, eye and a black cap. That's actually the female. The males are much duller uh, there. And you've probably heard that they have this role reversal um, where it's uh, the, the females that compete for the males and then they lay, uh, uh, lay eggs because there's a super abundance of food. And then when they've laid their eggs, the male does all the incubation and the female goes off and tries to find another male that she can mate with then to uh, uh, lay another clutch of eggs for him to do. So the female plays no part whatsoever. So there's a reversal. It's normally males that are brightly coloured who can meet Pete for females. Here, the males are the dull ones that incubate and the females are the brightly coloured ones. And if you want absolute proof of it, there's the bright coloured female being mated by the dull uh, male that I took on uh, Logoya there. And another bizarre thing, I wouldn't have normally shown you this, but this with three identical phalaro pegs and then a different looking one top left uh, is a sure sign that something genetically different has laid the egg in there, which is a, a different female. But when the male is doing all the incubation, you wonder why they bother to egg dump. Because, you know, if you've got fertilized with your eggs, you might just lay them and then a ma your male will uh, incubate them. That's what males do. So uh, that's a real uh, puzzling uh, uh, little incident that we found there on Mogoya. This is also a place where Sabine's gulls breed as well. So, uh, so, uh, and uh, you know, we, we've had some really, really good close views of uh, Sabine's gulls there. And I uh, just uh, mentioned briefly as well. This is the Arctic mirage that you get called the Fata Morgana, which is the uh, the opposite of what you get in in Britain. Uh, and mirages occur where there's a big stark contrast between the air temperature and the ground temperature. And in Britain, when you've had the sun beating down on hot roads, and then the the, the sun goes behind a cloud and it chills, then the difference in temperature between the hot road and the colder air, it, it bends air down and it's like pulling a bit of, of sky and dumping it on the water so it looks on the road so it looks like water. This is the opposite because the ground is cold but the air is heated up with the uh, sun. It stretches things up so that thing that looks like a cliff in the middle distance is actually just a thin layer of ice floating on the sea but uh, it's uh, it rises up to look like cliffs and sometimes if you get a boat in the distance the boat abnormally uh, rises up like some grotesque cartoon so all the time I've been to uh, Svalbard, I've seen some pretty amazing things like big groups of, uh, of polar bears uh, feeding on whale carcasses. I think I've seen that three times now. Uh, this is only a single one because they don't like to fight. And what they do is they wait their turn and wait till the males are finished and they go off. And then the females with cubs will come in. But this is uh, a female. She did actually have a cub nearby feeding off the scrap end of a, a fin whale carcass. Um, I've also seen um, uh, polar bears rubbing noses and even kissing. <laughs> it's, uh, and then when they've done that, they start to horseplay around. You can see just courting, just messing around. It's just so brilliant to see. And uh, this is a two-year-old cub that was suckling from its mother. I mean, literally just a few feet away from us. We were on the main boat here. We weren't even on a Zodiac. And uh, we've been watching these polar bears for a, a, a while. And then uh, uh, the, the babies just started uh, suckling, which is absolutely brilliant. I've seen uh, polar bears leaping between bits of pack ice. This didn't end well. He splashed into the water a few seconds later. And I've also seen polar bears pulling their tongue out at us uh, as if mocking us. So um, anyway, uh, if you'd like to join us, we have uh, 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 places available on our full charter on the Ortelius. It runs from the 20th of June to the 30th of June next year, next summer, 2023. That's at the height of summer when we'll get all the sunshine and we'll also be getting... Uh, all the flowers will be out 